Out to center. This is cranked. It's way back. It is gone! Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. Today we have on Dr. Lynn Lashbrook, who is the founder of Sports Management Worldwide. Sports Management Worldwide is an accredited online sports management school and is certified by the Oregon Department of Education. They offer over 35 different sports management courses and have over 20,000 graduates from over 162 different countries. Today, we talked through a bit of Lynn's story on how we got into becoming a sports agent, how we founded Sports Management Worldwide, and much more. A big thank you to Lynn for taking the time to sit down at their headquarters in Portland, Oregon, and I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. This episode is sponsored by Black Label Supplements. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And if you take creatine already, make sure to check out their Pure Power Sour Watermelon flavor. That is definitely my go-to, my favorite flavor to date. And as always, if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, also known as the Couch GM, to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. It's my goal to become the go-to lender for all sports fans and athletes in the Pacific Northwest. My contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, we're here today with Dr. Lynn Lashbrook, who is the founder of Sports Management Worldwide. We're in your offices here today. First off, thank you for having me. Yeah. And I'm excited to hear your story. So let's start off with just how you got into sports. Well, I, I appreciate you coming by. Uh, grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, and um, started going to baseball games when I was uh, seven years old. The A's, Kansas City A's, people don't realize that. And I fell in love the first game. And um, later on, three or four years later, I, I tell people I was a father of analytics. I started catching foul balls. I go to left to right field back when Darren Johnson, Gino Simoli, and others at the old municipal stadium and fell in love with, uh, with baseball. And then, of course, the Chiefs came, and I went to the NFL game. So I grew up with love and sports. Smallest guy in the largest high school. Uh, ended up um, uh, playing football uh, and baseball, and we won the state championship. But I was very small, so I walked on at Fort Hay State, and that's how I got my uh, uh, start in college athletics and scholarship after the first game. Uh, four years later, uh, graduate, I wanted to get back to college athletics and work in sports. So I went to Springfield College in Massachusetts, the birthplace of basketball. It was a great experience. And then I realized that if I could go get my doctorate, I might be able to get hired as a professor and then coach, which was my dream job to return to my alma mater. Okay. And two years later, the University of Northern Colorado walked on again. Uh, the second year, I was a head coach of the freshman team and got my doctorate work completed driving through Hayes, and they needed somebody for one semester to teach physiology and kinesiology, et cetera, golf and track, which I never ran. But I watered the center track when I was at Fort Hayes, and the track coach liked my work ethic. So I got hired at Fort Hayes and uh, coached football and track and taught and had tenure. And 1980, I got a little restless, and I went to the University of Missouri as assistant athletic director in charge of academics and compliance. And there uh, was an exciting time. I became president of the National Association of Academic Advisors. We led the big eight in graduation rate. And then I got a little restless again, and I became athletic director at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. And I did that three years. It was a commuter campus, but we made it into a college atmosphere. The three-point line started up. We had a really credible coach. Uh, then I, I wanted more, so I went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. The wall was going down in Germany from my Springfield College. I'd studied Russia. And we started an exchange, and uh, what an exciting five years up at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Wow. We got our hockey team in the CCHA with Michigan, Michigan State, and it was just fabulous. I uh, had a chance to go to Western Michigan, but I also wanted to watch my son play high school ball uh, back in Kansas City. And so I took a, went over across the, uh, to Jim Steiner's office, Jerry Rice's agent, Joe Carter. Uh, he and Jim Turner, and I asked if I could be an agent. They weren't excited. They didn't think it'd be a good, it's too hard. And I knew people. And the first year, I had four players in the NFL. Um, that was exciting. I got a player named Ralph Dawkins out of Louisville, an undrafted free agent. But he had a younger brother named Brian out of Clemson. And two years later, I represented Brian, a second-round pick, who later became an NFL Hall of Famer uh, for the Eagles and also played for Denver. And then... Uh, as I was um, recruiting uh, in St. Louis and had 20 players in the NFL, I moved to Portland to start my life over. 
started teaching at Oregon State, and the Jerry Maguire movie came out. <laughs> I was fascinated with the online education component, uh, potential to educate the world. And I started a company, How to Be a Sports Agent. And um, we started with one student and then two, dial up Yahoo. Fast forward today, almost 30 years, we have over 30,000 alums, over four, 40 courses taught by industry leaders, baseball analytics, baseball agent, mm -hmm. uh, baseball scouting. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, we have students from 163 different countries. Uh, I also, with my passion for baseball, have spent the last 25 years uh, MLB to PDX. I started the campaign uh, to bring Major League Baseball, and people laugh that maybe that'll never happen. They're still going to expand two teams. Yep. Now that the A's that left Oakland are now going to Vegas, it's possible uh, that we have, the, we have the right time zone and the right location and the right size city that someday we'll get Major League Baseball. Now that's a hobby, but I'm passionate about. I'm more focused on the growing of our company globally as we continue to address. Yeah, man, that's, there's a lot to cover yeah, there. Yeah, no, I'm sorry I rambled too long. <laughs> no, yeah, you're yeah. good. Okay. So you're moving around as an athletic director, trying to find, you know, were you trying to find what you want to do beyond that? I think what happens, uh, you accomplish, uh, you reach a lot of milestones or goals uh, everywhere I went. I feel like I just was passionate. And I loved, I was curious about the world of sports and became more curious. And, uh, and, and as I just expand, I was a, I've always been an educator. I always felt like growing up that you have to have a ticket to the game to catch a foul ball. And I believe when online came, I could create that ticket to the game. So all our courses are designed as a ticket to the game to catch a foul ball. Metaphorically, I'm just a passionate educator and mm -hmm. I think it's fun to provide a toolbox I benefited from knowing Jim Steiner, got a chance to go to Missouri, got my doctorate. But I really want anybody that wants to get, work in sports, whether you're 70 years old, we had a scout take our course, became associate scout for the Angels and lived in Clovis, New Mexico. And one course, and he, he, he was fortunate, he's passed away. But my point is, we have 71-year-olds and 17-year-olds in our program. If you want to get paid for your passion, I don't think a university degree alone gets you in the ecosystem. So that's who we are. For sure. And I mean, you look at nowadays, the education system, you don't need your, a college degree for a lot of things. Yeah. And kind of as you're describing, if you get a certification like this or take a class like this specific yeah. to the, the niche right. that you want to get into, yeah. that could fast track. Your, your... So for example, um, Ari Kaplan, who was with the Cubs for years, analytics. Mike Matheny, actually, uh, John Boggs was our... Uh, uh, it teaches our baseball agent course, but his client was Mike Matheny. When he was out of the job with St. Louis and consulting with the Royals, uh, he, he took our, our analytics course, and he later became the Royals manager. And my point was that all of our faculty are industry leaders. Dan Evans, former GM of the Dodgers. Uh, Hank Jones, lifelong MLB scout. So the students get access to industry leaders. I have a degree in kinesiology. There's 206 bones in the body. Uh, that, that's not relevant to analytics or rugby or cricket or mm -hmm. digital video editing. Uh, it goes on and on. And so that's where I take a lot of pride. We decided that we can, and we offer for college credit, but we decided we can teach people. There's faculty out there that want to give back. And so online with our live chats worldwide, uh, it's something special that really nobody else can offer. And it's, I'm very excited about our growth and our potential. Absolutely. I want to get into your program yeah. for sure. But yeah. take me back to the, at, when you first became a sports agent and yeah. getting your first client yeah. and that entire experience. Yeah. Well, I, I was uh, back then I, I had network like the old coach at four days was an NFL scout and he gave me some leads. Uh, when you have Jerry Rice uh, as a client, you can usually get in anybody's living room. And that's what we, uh, so that's how we got started. And, you know, if you get one person from Stanford, you might get the next year's player. I had mm -hmm. three years in a row, I had a uh, uh, University of Oregon uh, player and ended up with Josh Wilcox. Two years later, I had Jeremy Asher, Steve Harden, and, and Josh Wilcox. And it just kept, Mark Fields, I knew um, uh, Mike Price out of uh, uh, Washington State. And um, I kept working when I moved out to Portland and, and I, Mark Fields and Tom Mosby, who was a, his former agent academic advisor, and we put together a package. And so I had a lot of success with my relationships. Mm -hmm. And then I had the expertise from Jim Steiner. What we've done today in our agent world 
Everybody knows somebody that knows somebody. Mm -hmm. And now with NIL, name, image, and likeness, the high school seniors, some kids don't go to college, like Bobby Witt Jr., mm -hmm. but everybody knows somebody that um, is looking to pick a school or transfer and go to the pros. And the relationship drives the business. So if you can take somebody with a relationship and give them the credentials, then they can monetize that. And so I call it the Uber uh, factor. Uber drivers have a car, they fill out an app, and they go to the airport and they pick up a passenger, they get approved, and they make money. The passenger gets off the plane and goes to the app. And the first, the closest one to the airport gets the business. So if you look at our student athletes around the world, and my favorite story is Cavante Turpin of the Cowboys. He was 26 years old. Two guys from Monroe, Louisiana took an eight-week course. The mother from Monroe, Louisiana said, can you help my son? Well, the son is 26 years old playing in Poland. There's no way, because I'm a veteran agent, right? They brought him back, and he got in the USFL, and he actually played for Mike Riley, the former Oregon State coach. And he was so fast, he did very well, and he made MVP. And then it came to how to get on the NFL team. He had some problems when he left TCU, got suspended, and only one team, the Dallas Cowboys, and Mike McCarthy was a Fort Hayes graduate like I am. And that didn't hurt, but I don't know if that was the total answer, but Cavante's first two touches, 98 yards, second quarter, 68 yards. He not only made the Cowboys, he was Pro Bowl. Wow. Okay, three years, this is third year, they're changing the rules for kickoff return. Who knows what the future is? But if it wasn't for two guys from Monroe, Louisiana, we never would have represented Cavante. But if it wasn't for SMWW, they wouldn't have the credentials to represent Cavante. And so our dream and I go back to Travis uh, Bazana, who's the top player in the country, maybe mm -hmm. the second pick in the draft or the first pick. He's from Australia. I talked to his dad at the Oregon State game in the, in the regionals, and you know there was no NIL uh, for that. And it's an amazing story. He always wanted to play baseball, even though he grew up with cricket and rugby. So we see a 2.0 revolution of opportunity. And there's bipartisan legislation today in D.C. to try to allow the international student to qualify for NIL deals, like the, the center from Purdue that played in the Final Four. That's happening. And when that happens, now you've got 8 billion people to look at baseball. If you look at the World uh, Classic uh, that, that they're doing, and mm -hmm. the NFL playing in Brazil next year, and in Germany and England, and you look at the NBA Africa, and you look at cricket of all sports, is hosted right now the United States cricket, which gets a 350 million people for their quote championship. The Super Bowl gets 120 million. So yeah. we're in a revolution of global opportunity for scouts, for analytics, for digital video editing, uh, for agent representation, for NIL. I've never seen anything like it. And then all the realignment in colleges and transfer portal. It's a fascinating time to work in sports. Absolutely. A guy that I played on that Pickles All-Star team with last night, he ended up getting to AAA with the White Sox. But after he was done with the White Sox, he ended up going and playing in uh, Mexico and then over in Germany. And it's, there's a legit league in Germany I had no clue about. So there's leagues all throughout the country or all throughout the world that, you know, as you mentioned, now provide opportunities. So, you know, that's a, you bring up, I say go global or go home is kind of my mantra. And, and you're absolutely right. The streaming has allowed more eyeballs, whether it's Travis Bazan or others. There's a kid in Australia that wanted to play American football, and the Chiefs have signed him. And so when you look at talent, for example, with me being the smallest guy in a large high school, I'm sure I would have migrated to, to cricket or soccer, if I may, versus football. And so when I look at that and I see the streaming and the valuations, valuations going, and then sports betting brings more gluership, and then the NIL, and so what's happening with NIL, the baseball player or the European basketball player is saying, why wouldn't I come to America? I can make millions of dollars playing uh, college basketball or college baseball. And yeah. so the revolution going on is happening right in front of us right now. Absolutely. So, you know, you get your, your first few clients. Uh, you have Jerry Rice as a client, which is insane. Yeah. Um, walk me through, when you, when you move out to Portland, when did you start sports management worldwide? So the Jerry Maguire movie came out, and I was recruiting Ryan Leaf. And um, at the last minute, I thought, sure, I was going to get Ryan Leaf. Mike Price was with me at Missouri. 
uh, he was assistant coach. And Jack Johnson, um, Ryan's high school coach at Great Falls, Montana, uh, was with me at Northern Colorado. So I had all the pieces, and I went to every one of Ryan's games, met the parents, flew out to Great Falls, met with the parents. We played golf with Ryan and his dad, um, and, and everything looked good. But that's the way the world goes. And, and so uh, Lee was representing Mike Price. And so when you start representing coaches, that becomes an issue. I won't allow our agent advisors to represent coaches because it's a conflict. I just want to have a clean, ethical uh, company. But what I found uh, when I lost Ryan Leaf and the internet started up and the Jerry Maguire movie came out, it all just kind of clicked and we started dial up Yahoo. And it was a long struggle. And then uh, as we started to the next course, how to work in, in sports, you know, kind of ticket sales, and then we added baseball. Rob Nyer, uh, a former uh, ESPN announcer or columnist, Rob um, uh, helped us with um, uh, Larry D'Amato was our first scout. And then, of course, um, we just kept expanding. And then we started adding rugby and cricket and uh, football, basketball, baseball and um, hockey. And we go in and get industry leaders. And now we do conference like we'll be in Vegas for the NBA Summer League. We'll be in Vegas for the NHL draft. And let's face it, Vegas baseball's coming to Vegas and NBA basketball's coming to Vegas. Mm -hmm. Who would have ever thought that hockey would expand to the Southern Hemisphere, if I may? Look what's going on. And then with World Cup soccer coming to America and baseball playing in England just a week ago, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. There's an opportunity to play. And the business side is very exciting what's going on. It's a... I call it a trillion dollar business, and in my lifetime, it's gonna be two trillion dollars. Jerry Maguire movie comes out. I'm curious with what you thought of that movie and how much of that is true, and then after that, walk me through a day in the life of what it's like to be a sports agent. Sure, I, I felt, uh, I thought it was an incredible, well, obviously, historically, uh, you look back, it's an incredible, it brought the agent world out of the, I guess I say the closet, nobody really knew what an agent was. So that was a huge surge mm -hmm. of now people know what a sports agent is. And this is before NIL. And I looked at it, I'll never forget Alex Van Dyke, one of my uh, first pick in the second round when Keyshawn Johnson went in the first round. But I realized as I started adding more clients to the agent world, the personal needs were so important. And the more clients you had, the more diluted the relationship. And that's the light bulb that went off. If you could train people all over the world and maybe have fewer clients, but give them the expertise. And this is before NIL or the globalization that we're talking about. So I passionately thought maybe an agent with fewer clients, but a backdrop credential of all the support, and yet more one-on-one. -on -one. And I felt that was something missing. For example, every athlete, uh, not going to play forever, so they need a second career. And sadly, a lot of athletes don't have the success off the field, their investment. And that's a one-on-one -on -one approach. And nobody knows the player than the family. And so we're very inclusive. I always, my secret was working with the mom. If you can get the mom, uh, you can get the player. And that's we, the Dawkins. I met with them, with Ralph, and we did a great job with Ralph. Ralph called me back 20 years later and wanted me to represent his son, uh, who played at Colorado State. Brian, I see at the NFL every year, and they appreciate what Jim Steiner and I did. But once you have the ecosystem, then you meet all the GMs mm -hmm. uh, over time. It's an exciting. I love being an agent. I love now helping people become an agent. And remember, you really can't be a successful agent unless you're in the NIL world. And every athlete needs, like a golfer has a caddy. Mm -hmm. Every athlete needs representation. That's why our most popular course is the agent or NIL, because then we have an agent advisor program. We want people to monetize their passion for the game. I'm not interested in just selling courses and you have a certificate. I say it's not the certificate on the wall that's most important, it's the wall. And I mean that. And so people can make money in sports while they keep their day job. They can take course and have one client. I jokingly say, you want to wear flip-flops. You want to make money. There's nothing wrong making money in sports. Absolutely. So walking through your, your program that you've built out, um, technology has obviously advanced yeah. over the years. Yeah. So when you were first starting those classes until now, I looked on your website, yeah. you have a ton of classes on there. So the formula is the same. They're eight weeks. Lifetime membership, resume service. I do a worldwide chat every Sunday. I've been doing it for almost 30 years. Wow. And it started with one student and then two on Dial Up Yahoo. 
Uh, we got an incredible staff here. Uh, Ike, my associate, came up with Zoom way before COVID, so we got into Zoom. Uh, I've had some of our staff have been with me for 14 years. And the point I'm trying to make is once you've got this formula, uh, these online chats, asynchronous learning, live but asynchronous, fun, informational interviews. Every time somebody does an interview around the world with an executive, they submit the interview and we send a thank you note and a Starbucks gift card. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we appreciate what Howard Schultz has done in the world. They started with one Starbucks. My dream is to grow this company so you have representatives in all over the world. Mm -hmm. We have students from Africa and, and different parts of the world and think about it, the culture is different. The sport is the same, the rules are the same. Look how many Latin American players are in baseball. And now with AI, we're getting ready to offer what we call transcreation or multiple languages. And when you start adding French and Germany, Portuguese, Brazil is where the base football game is going to be, Spanish, which is right, you know, part of the world, instead of just English. We really think we have a chance at this point uh, to grow through the language with AI. AI is here to stay, and it's just exciting. At the end of the day, a player and a family need advice. Now parents need advice. Should I go pro like Bobby Witt Jr.? Should I go to college? If I'm in college and it's not working out, should I transfer? Should I stay? That's a one-on-one. -on -one. And as I watch the PGA Tour, I think about the caddy and the golfer. Mm -hmm. Golfers don't have a corporate agency. They have a caddy. And that caddy knows them and works with them. That's really what I want the agent advisor to be in the future, whether it's baseball. Baseball's a long journey. And the agent doesn't get them to the next level. They advise them. But the talent discovery, I, jo I jokingly say it's about relationship discovery. But the opportunity to monetize your learning of the business of sport having a relationship. Everybody knows somebody that knows somebody. Absolutely. It sounds like you know a lot about rugby and about cricket. Where do you see the opportunity with cricket? You know, for example, with Australia, yeah. cricket is a big thing worldwide. Yeah. You got Travis Pisano, who's coming out of Australia. Yeah. How can you tap into both markets? And Well, I'm doing it. It's funny. Even with our baseball, we've discovered uh, 250 acres. Uh, in the area out in, in Gresham, which is light rail, it'd be right next to home plate. 250 acres, a lot of acres. Barry Smith, the architect I've been working with 25 years, uh, we've decided, uh, and we're putting together a proposal, uh, Cricket wants to expand. Uh, they, they, they have uh, six teams right now in New York and Florida, and, and Seattle has one. In Portland, we is, uh, there's a lot of cricket going on on Saturdays, really? and believe it or not. And so we're looking at cricket, we're looking at the soccer uh, facilities, uh, particularly with the new women's uh, ownership uh, group. And of course we want Major League Baseball. But the venue of sports in Portland with only one major team here, uh, I, you know, we have soccer of course and then basketball. Portland is really uh, opportunity. And land is what's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody talks about we've got this, we're, gonna, we're connected. I don't need an owner. You gotta have population, you got to have the political uh, apparatus. You got to have some incentives, but you got to have land, and you have to have transportation. And if you look at MLB to PDX.com, you'll see how much work's been done. The reason we stay out of the public eye until the owners, till the MLB says we're going to expand, owners will start looking. And if you get out too early, you lose your credibility. So even though we we're way out there when Montreal was going to move, uh, there's been no movement right now. So we're laying low and working on uh, the apparatus to get in place. So I'm never going to give up on baseball, as you can tell by my passion. So talking about MLB to PDX, it sounds like you, were you actually the start of MLB to PDX? I, I came to town. My architect that helped me build the uh, rec center in Alaska, John Vosme, uh, the one that kept asking about AAA baseball. And when I moved to town, this is a true story, um, I had no idea much about Portland. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to help. And uh, I went to the library. Back then, they had libraries. I haven't been to libraries since. But I found out that Kansas City was bigger than Portland. And the light bulb went off. Why would we go for minor league if we can get major league? If we're bigger than Kansas City, and maybe I was naive, but I con contacted the Montreal Expos. Uh, we made contact. Wow. Um, and, and we brought in uh, uh, consultants. Craig Bird, Bird Financial, donated 
contributed money and John Bosmick built the model. And before you know it, we were all over the newspaper stirring it up. People weren't thinking about triple, I mean, about Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. And so I've, st you know, and I've had some failures on the way. We haven't progressed very much in 25 years. On the other hand, it's not going away. Portland's a large city. We have lots of challenges right now. Uh, Atlanta went outside the suburb, and that's why I think Gresham, by the way, our mayor in Gresham is also from Kansas City, Kansas, and he understands it. Kansas City, Kansas is actually trying to lure the Royals and the Chiefs to Kansas City, Kansas. It's about land transportation more mm -hmm. than it is you have to be in downtown. I love downtown baseball cities, but I'm not convinced that's the only place that'll work. So the world has changed. And uh, these values, these franchises, and by the way, Mexico, where we went for the Kansas City Chiefs game, Matt Moore was my client for many years. And I looked at Mexico, you know, that baseball is going to expand to Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, the the NFL is going to expand to Europe. And so if you think about the globalization of franchises, there's only a few more slots in, in, the, in America before they start looking globally. So it's a real exciting time. The baseball is still drives me every day. I named my son Brett after George Brett. I've met George many times. And to be honest with you, I love the game of baseball. And now with the clock, it's fascinating, the growth of baseball and how well they're doing. And even Kansas City this year, a small market and no salary cap, if I may, but Kansas City's doing well. There's only nine positions at a time mm -hmm. in baseball. And if you look at the globalization and the Travis Bazanas and et cetera, the talent discovery is an equalizer here. It's a, it's a fun time to be in sports. I've never been more excited about the globalization of sports and particularly watching the major league game in London. And why wouldn't you? You know, it used to be the World Series. Uh, they call it the World Series, but no other country was invited except uh, <laughs> Montreal or Toronto. And you think about it now, uh, globally, the Olympics, the World Cup coming here mm -hmm. is going to be unbelievable. It surpasses anything you can imagine domestically. So I think it's a very exciting time for the talent discovery model. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. And you would think that Portland, you know, they have a, a basketball team. Should they also get football, baseball, NHL at some point? And I, I didn't know that the whole yeah. MLB PDX idea has been going for 25 years. Yeah, I only no, saw I, it recently with Russell Wilson and everybody getting involved. In All those are good. Uh, Craig Cheek and the, and the Diamond Project, all -star, I gave them all my Rolodex. Uh, the difference was I feel that after I showed him Gresham, Mayor Bemis invited me out. He wanted Major League Baseball. Just to have a mayor that wanted Major League Baseball. I remember Mayor Wheeler, who's been in my office, but before when he's running for mayor, they were asked one day, uh, we need Major League Baseball. This is his primary way back. And he said, well, no, we have the pickles and the hops. Now, <laughs> it's not an insult to the pickles and hops, but that's not Major League Baseball. Right. And Portland, and there was the AAA Beavers. Yeah, yeah, but Major League is Major League. And, right. and, you know, God bless Phil Knight. And we met with Phil Knight. I've been in his office. He loves baseball. It wasn't a good business investment at the time. He's got his Morgan Ducks, and he's done an incredible job for the city. But it's just where usually you have a local owner. I, you know, uh, uh, the Blazers weren't locally owned, if I may. I mean, uh, 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 Mr. Glickman obviously was a huge leader for the Blazers and everything like that. But Paul Allen did not live in Portland. And when he passed away, we lost some of that nucleus. So what's interesting is we don't need a local owner. It's too big of a business. There's so much money out there that wants to invest in sport. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm confident that we can still make it happen. Does it have to be downtown? I'd love to have it downtown. But if it can't be downtown, there's other places. Atlanta made the battery work. So you can't tell me we couldn't make uh, the rock, I call it, because it's out at Rockwood. We could make the rock work. Nobody has a light rail that goes right up to the stadium. I grew up in Kansas City, the Ballpark Express. Uh, 50 cents or 75 cents to go round trip and 50 cents to get in. So I get transportation and we have that already. Yeah, I've seen uh, renderings in the uh, northwest industrial spot. I've seen yeah. east in like almost Troutdale area. Yeah. And then there's Hillsboro that's absolutely blowing yeah. up. There's Beaverton. There's yeah. all these different spots. Yeah. I'm really excited to see. Well, where I, that, where you know, that transportation is a big issue when you start looking at red tail and everything. I'm for I'll I'll go to the first game wherever it is. I. I just think baseball is so important to mm -hmm. society, and I watch what Seattle's done, and I, I just love going up there to their games. But I always say we're not a suburb of 
of Seattle. I don't think hockey will ever work because they're already in Seattle. And remember, hockey wants to go global too. So you've got to be careful. There's just not many slots left for domestic growth. The rest is going to be global. Right. Yeah. So what is your favorite part of being a sports agent? So my favorite part is the relationship. Uh, I mean, Matt Moore and I talk uh, monthly. Alex Van Dyke invited me to his 30-year uh, reunion, if I may, a celebration is his life and his wife and everything. But um, the relationships I've had over the years and trying to have an impact on people and do it the right way. Um, Alex Van Dyke has his own business called Going Vertical. I literally uh, spent the last year of his career, I could see that he's not going to last long, you know, because the market changes. Uh, so I take a lot of pride in my years as a, as a professor as an athletic director, as a, um, I've just been in the ecosystem since I was five years old and I, I played catch with my dad. And I, you know, even doing this podcast today, I never turned down the opportunity to share the story. SMWW, simply I say, if you can't spell it, I won't be able to help you. <laughs> but it's impossible once you look at our website that we don't provide you some kind of a tool uh, to get paid for your passion. I always tell students, adrenalize today, and monetize tomorrow. I'm a capitalist. We want to grow our company. We want to do multi-languages. Uh, we're getting ready to do a global ambassador program. Uh, we're looking at opportunity to qualify for the GI Bill. Uh, we're just growing like crazy. And I'm proud of that. And I'm motivated by, there's three people in sports that have motivated me. Lamar Hunt, growing up in Kansas City. Not only did he start the Super Bowl and start the merger, the American Football League, because nobody would give him a franchise. I learned a lot from that. He also brought soccer to America. He and Phil Anschutz, a Kansas native. Nobody wanted soccer. I didn't think it'd ever work. Look what soccer's done uh, in America. I watched Howard Schultz started with one vision, one coffee shop, and look where Starbucks is around mm -hmm. the world. And I just admire those kind. And I, you know, Steve Jobs and the and the cell phone. Uh, I, I just admire what. Uh, what people have done. And I've sat in the stands with Lamar Hunt when Clark was a um, soccer player uh, at SMU. Um, I've met Howard Schultz before, actually lived up Madison Park, ran into him before. Uh, and it's exciting to see uh, those visionaries like that. And then Charlie Finley, the Oakland A's, he was an innovator. He brought in Knight World Series baseball. He won the Orange Baseball. Um, I sat next to him, a little kid at the in the bleachers, but I've had a lot of uh, influences out there, and I think that um, I think sports is so important. I always say sports is a weapon of mass construction; it's a substitute for war, and we need more sports in a, to save our world. And the challenges we have in our country today, and the polarization politically, sports does bring us together. And don't forget women's sports and what Caitlin Clark has done and the growth of women's sport and women's soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fascinating how much women's sports is spreading and the opportunities to work in sports. Uh, it's just an exciting time to be in sport. And women's softball, I just, this is a crazy time. I call it a 2.0 sports business revolution. I love that point on how sports really does bring us together. And I mean, the world connects on sports. And if we could be playing more sports, then yeah. you know, people will and I don't want to forget what Phil Knight did with the Waffle Shoe. Um, the Waffle and I shoe. watched the Air movie. Um, yep. I, I got to be honest, with being in his office and watching what he did with one shoe, and I look today, and I kind of sometimes feel we're at the shoe, we're at the Waffle Iron, <laughs> and they, they made different shoes. But look what Nike's done to the world, the footprint and other products, and now Hoka's taking over part of this world. But uh, if you look at the growth of sports, Portland has got a lot of history here. And sports may worldwide, we're not there yet. We're really small, but we got a bright future. We're committed. We got the right staff. We got the right faculty. We're global. Mm -hmm. And when you play the AI card and the Global Ambassador Program, I, I hope that someday we're talking back here and talking about where we, where we are versus where we were. Absolutely. I'm curious myself as a sports fan, as someone that went to school for finance and marketing, um, what it looks like to, to be a sports agent as far as, yeah. okay, you make contact with a player, you get them signed under your agency. Yeah. What does it look like to represent a player throughout the process? Like, let's say someone just got drafted. What, what are the services Absolutely. that you are know, provided? It's, it's very interesting. First of all, they, they need to stay grounded. So managing expectations. Uh, I know students or uh, athletes that don't get drafted. I remember Matt Moore said in here, and his dad was here. This is after his very successful 
Oregon State. But I had enough information uh, to assure him that he wasn't going to be drafted. And mm -hmm. I remember it didn't go over very well. But I'm a, I'm a can I'm an honest guy, and 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 I jokingly said I said I will buy the whole family steak dinners if I'm wrong. But that's managing expectations. The first saying representation to know your family and the family dynamics. It's impossible uh, to have a hundred clients and say you know everybody. Uh, you get the draft and 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 and, and negotiations. If you got more than one team uh, uh, coming after you, it's a matter of getting the best offer. Never mm -hmm. make an offer. I remember when Matt was in Miami, and he's free agent, but he wanted to stay in Miami. Uh, but Tampa Bay really wanted him. They felt like uh, he was on um, uh, hard knocks and they could see his character. And so uh, uh, Mark Dominic really wanted him. And Jeff Ireland and Miami would only pay so much. And I said, I know the market. And, and the GM said, yeah, but I know the market better than you. And I said, well, <laughs> sorry, I know where we're going to have to go. And we hung up politely. It wasn't a big show. And they called back and we got what we wanted because Matt wanted to stay in Miami, but we also wanted to get the market value. Mm -hmm. So I can teach people the calmness of being an agent. I think it's overrated that it's complex. I think it's difficult to get into because if you don't have this big agency, you can't do it. But now with NIL, now with NIL, there's not enough agencies out there. It's one-on-one, -on -one, caddy and golfer, okay? So if you get the relationship, the business is driven by relationship. So if you have a relationship, it's like Nick Lubasich. He had relationships. He's mm -hmm. built up a nice agency. He interned in our office. So <clears throat> we give people a chance. But what people don't realize, you know, there's only so many scouts. So I always say you're scouting. Why don't you represent the player? You can monetize it, and then you'll get a referral, and now you're making money. And you still keep your day job until you make more money in the agent world. So being an agent is, is common sense. Uh, you like to have the uh, the experience, like we provide our agent advisors, but it's not something that somebody couldn't learn. And uh, I think it's a thrill. I love turn on the TV and and Cavante Turpin scores a touchdown, and you give him a call afterwards. I love seeing going to games. I love going to Kansas City, and Matt Moore was playing or on the bench mentoring. Uh, uh, a guy named Patrick Mahomes. It's a great story. It's fun. And then you meet all the GMs. So at the end of the day, in my world, since I'm 75, I've met almost everybody in the sport business world. It's a thrill to pass my Rolodex down to a generation of people that deserve the opportunity to work in sports. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, let's say you have a free agent that's a client. Mm -hmm. um, are you personally reaching out to every team saying, hey, this guy's available? This is That's kind of a myth because... They have 24-7 scouts, so right. they know, like after the draft, if somebody doesn't get called, it's not like the agent got him called by calling around. It really is over, uh, I, you don't agent your way to the NFL, you, you advise. Mm -hmm. And so they have all that information. The reason they're not calling, because the radar, they have a big bulletin board and it's not there. And so you have to, you can overstay your welcome as an aggressive agent. So mm -hmm. I try to teach them that it's market driven and manage expectations. And that's why it's easy to teach somebody how to be an agent. Because if you have the player, you'll get the phone calls. It's not because you're a good agent you get all these phone calls. It's overplayed. And that's agents we all like to create how important we are. You notice that I'm being very transparent here. Mm -hmm. I take a lot of it pride in teaching people how to be an agent because there's so many people capable of being an agent. But because they didn't have a brother that played that level or they didn't play that level, they couldn't get into sports. Before, if you didn't play the game of sports and coach, you just couldn't work in sports. Today, whether it's podcasting or representation or online, there's a thousand ways to get into sports that we didn't have open for us 20, 30 years ago. Why we have more women in sports? Analytics is open. The letter jacket is no longer important to work in sports. What's important is the game, the mousetrap. What can you do to bring me more revenue? What can you do to get, you know, Moneyball really changed the world. Moneyball is applicable to all sports, if I may, and mm -hmm. that's what's happening. That's what's exciting about sport. Your letter jacket is not the only criteria to get in. It's nice to have a resume. I played at Fort Hayes State. Nobody cares. But at the same time, I understand sports because I've been in it all my life. And I, when you do informational interviews, you also get to ask other people. And before you know it, the only thing missing with people not working in sports is they don't have the connectivity. And mm -hmm. we try to provide an ecosystem for that. You make a good point that you know it, it pays to have good players that you're representing because that will bring in the phone calls. Yeah. So that's interesting because, yeah, myself, having, having no experience yeah. in that field, I'm just curious about 
what it looks like behind the scenes, you know, how many GMs. Yeah, it's a thrill. And, and separating, I, I went through this when I, of course, we had Jerry Rice, but other agencies had big time players and everybody's tried to, and I realize it's just face to face, meet face to face, show some attention, listen and learn. Everybody has a different issue, a different concern, honesty, integrity, and, and it, transparency. And I think that what so many people bring to the table is their unique skill sets of being transparent, honest people. Mm -hmm. We talk about the ethical compass and you can feel ethical electricity in my worldwide chat. It's not like we create ethics. We, it, we attract ethical people. I use the term guthics. It takes guts to, to enforce ethics. It's easy to talk about ethics all day, mm -hmm. but it takes guts to do things right. And I think that's where we try to provide that leadership and that mentoring. And that's what's exciting. But I just see, I can't imagine not working in sports. I mean, I was a farm boy, city boy, but ever since I played catch with my dad at five years old, I literally have never left sports. And there's so many people with the same story, except I am, want people to monetize. So I'm 75, like a bottle of wine. I think I bring a lot to the sports world, but I have so much, I take so much pride in seeing people get into the sports ecosystem that had no chance of getting in until we came along with our virtual toolbox. And that's kind of our secret sauce. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I love that. I mean, I'm the same way in, in that I, I looked at various paths in mm -hmm. ways that I could stay in sports and college, but realistically in my mindset, I wanted to major in finance just so I could learn about how money right. worked. Yeah. And I ended up in mortgages, and that's where I saw the opportunity at the yeah. time. Yeah. And now I just started you know, the, this channel yeah. two and a half years ago and just out of a passion, and now I'm starting to see various doors open and where this could take me, and I'm starting to cross-pollinate my mortgage oh, I, business with sports. I see and, it in you. I mean, just you walked in in my office, and now we're doing a, a podcast. And I will tell you this, as I see the opportunity, we don't know what we don't know, but the vastness of the growth of opportunities, it's, it's crazy. And, and I always encourage, you know, you innovate or evaporate. And we had to innovate our company and expand. We started out just as an agency and we continue, you know, we have esports. We have sports betting because it's an industry. So we're never afraid uh, to, to think out of the box of trying to do that. But I, I go back to the, uh, just the starting of sports. You know, we had baseball, football, and basketball. And look at the TV ratings right now in all the sports. And, you know, with streaming and advertising, basically it has to be a live event. And look at Amazon putting on the Black Friday game. And look at the NFL now moving to Christmas Day. Uh, th this is an incredible time. And before, you know, streaming came along, I can watch all my games, better TV than I grew up with, on my phone. And mm -hmm. that's why the growth opportunities. And then NIL, I don't know where, where it's going, but I, it, it's exploding. It really is for podcasts and et cetera. So walk me through the NIL with, you know, where it's come over the past few years yeah. and where it's heading. So legally, uh, Supreme Court ruling, and it opened the door, and I was on the other side of that for years. I love the student-athlete concept. I now have a huge respect for NIL. The athlete has become more polished. Uh, the athletes become more responsible. The business side of NIL has made uh, everybody a little more responsible. Uh, companies are making money. Uh, you know, I, for example, I got three interceptions in one game at Fort Hay State. Every Sunday, I'd go to Al's Chicken Ed's, my favorite place growing up. I bet I could have got a free T-shirt if I had those three interceptions and I brought a bunch of, of my teammates in. Right. That's NIL. It goes all the way down. Many high schools or many states are approving high schools to do that. I think the biggest uh, uh, revolution, seismic change, is when NIL, as I talked to you earlier, uh, when the bipartisan legislation to lift the restrictions on the American visa and what the impact will have, particularly on the Euro basketball, but on sports at Travis Bazanas. And you think about global recruiting mm -hmm. and you think about small schools that rely on sports. Um, I, I can't get my arms around it yet, except the opportunity. That's why when we say go global, go home, yeah, I don't think we can survive as a company without thinking globally, which we're doing, and we're way ahead of the curve on that. Mm -hmm. And then I say go young or go home. If you don't follow that high school kid, uh, boy or girl, if you don't follow them, that relationship can be developed right there in your community, and the relationship drives the industry. That's a worldwide 
phenomena, relationships, relationships, and referrals. Mm -hmm. And so you see where I'm going with my vision of the company. So we do this one day at a time. We're not salesy. We, uh, we do a lot of uh, advertising, podcasts, et cetera, but our story is being told every day. And, and many of our students take two or three courses uh, because they want to learn more. They start out with the agent. And they say, wow, I got to learn NIL. And then all of a sudden they want to do social media. Um, you know, we do sports broadcasting. I was thinking about when you're doing the podcast, I went in high school in 1965. I wanted to be a sports broadcaster mm -hmm. like Merle Harmon and Harmon and Monty Moore back then. And I went to the library and I couldn't find anything on where mm -hmm. you go for sports broadcasting. Today, that's not the case. And that's why I enjoy what we're providing. I just want people all over the world to work in sports and think of the countries that haven't developed the same sophistication as America. But think of the opportunities and think of the cross-pollination of somebody from Germany working for the NFL because they know the culture better than the NFL. The NFL knows the game. And so that's the cross-pollination that's going on. I love it. Well, someone that wants to get into be learning more about being a sports yeah. agent or get into that field, yeah. what advice would you give them? Where would so you So SMWW, yep. I always say if you can't <laughs> spell it, I won't be able to help you. But if you fill out an application, just free of charge, we have career counselors. That's all they do is answer questions. We're not salesy. We just introduce you and answer your questions. And then we have conferences. We'll be down at the Vegas for the NHL draft. We'll be in the sphere. Uh, it's the last year of the draft. They're going to make it more like an NFL virtual, That'll be you cool. know, the war room. Uh, we'll go back for the NBA Summer League. Uh, we'll be in Dallas for the MLB Winter Meetings. Uh, we go to the Indianapolis for the NFL Combine every year. Uh, we do conferences all over the world. And now with our Global Ambassador Program, we'll be doing meet and greets around the world. I have two new knees this year, um, and I'm young at 75. We've got a book coming out called The Walk-On Approach, which thematically is our DNA. We just want you to build a walk-on, meet informational interviews, come to meet people. And mm -hmm. because you didn't grow up with your dad on the team or your brother playing that level, you can still m make money in sports. And that's where I think people didn't know that existed until we came along. So we're... We're really proud of our, our concept. We're proud of our alums, 30,000 alums. But we're proud of what we bring to the world and what, you know, we're, we're helping make it a better sports world. And that's why democratize uh, diversity, uh, access to opportunity, mm -hmm. democratize diversity. We're the most diverse sports company in the world. Take a look at our website. Come to one of our chats. You'll see everybody's out there. And that's the beauty of what we're trying to do to make it a better, get leaders from all over the world, not just from a certain uh, culture. Awesome. Well, Dr. Lynn, really appreciate your time. I'm excited to see your company continue to grow, and we'll see how we can. And I wish you the best on, uh, on the podcast world that you're in because I admire what you're doing, and I'm sure we'll be talking to each other again. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Out to center. This is great. It's way back, and it's good.